The year is 1998. Yo-yos are popular again. The Backstreet Boys are back. Bruce Willis will save all of humanity from a giant asteroid. And something happens with the president. In the background behind all of this, though, the World Wide Web is growing at an almost impossible pace. This is a time of enthusiasm and limitless possibilities. The internet fervor was real, with U.S. internet users more than doubling from 1997 to 2002, and with more than half of the population logging onto the web. This rate of growth was faster than any period since then. So for the business world, this meant that if you were serious about reaching your customers, you had to be on the web. And that sets the stage for what we'll be looking at today, the Cobalt Network's Rack All-in-One Server Appliance. Welcome to this serial port, everyone. Today, we want to talk about a small company that rode the dot-com bubble in the late 90s and ended up changing the internet as we know it. You've probably never heard of Cobalt Networks. They definitely aren't a household name, but they were instrumental in bringing about affordable, mass-produced, and most importantly, easy-to-use web servers. This was important because at the time in the mid to late 90s, businesses of all sizes were starting to wake up to the fact that they needed a presence on the web. It wasn't universal though, as there was some skepticism surrounding the commercial value of the internet, with one group calling it the info hypeway. The writing was on the wall though, and this meant demand for web hosting eventually took off. Web hosting up to this point mainly relied on expensive, difficult to administer servers that were often Unix-based like those from Sun Microsystems. And that's not to say that these were bad servers, but they did require a high level of knowledge and expertise. So naturally, most small businesses turned to their local internet service provider for help with hosting a domain and website. That was a problem though, because most ISPs in the mid to late 90s were small mom and pop style operations that served their local area. And it's easy to forget that they numbered in the thousands. Focused on serving primarily dial-up customers, they simply did not have the resources or knowledge to meet the business world's demand for web hosting services and tools. And that's where we find Cobalt Networks. The company was founded in 1996 in Silicon Valley by ex-Apple employees Mark Orr, Mark Wu, and Vivek Mera. Their first product was the Cube 2700, released in March of 1998. It was developed with just a few dozen employees. The name was an obvious reference to its form factor, and 2700 signified the atomic number 27 of Cobalt. This innovative device was touted as a microserver that delivered a ready-to-go file server mainly intended for a private intranet, but it also provided email and DNS servers and even supported discussion lists. The hardware design was striking, but does it look familiar? Cobalt actually thought about bringing a lawsuit against Apple because of the design similarities, and the fact that they were ex-employees made it even spicier. They passed on that though, and decided to let the success of the Cube speak for itself. And the Cube itself was based on an efficient, low power RISC architecture that ran on a modified version of Red Hat Linux. It's surprising to think about now, but Linux wasn't actually considered a serious server platform in the mid 90s. So this was seen as a risky venture by some. But just as the internet was showing everyone how easy everyday tasks could be made, Cobalt Networks showed the world the same was true with their solution to web servers. And with the success of the Cube, Cobalt quickly followed up with the first RAQ or Rack web server appliance in July of 1998. This was an all-in-one, or you could even say plug and play web server. The idea was that you could provide power and a network connection to the Rack, and you could set up your own web server in literally minutes. This setup could be entirely done in a graphical user interface as well, something unheard of when setting up a web server of this type and capability. This was not only a boon for ISPs, but even larger businesses as well. Racks were popular with larger providers like Nokia, WorldCom, Quest, and Sprint because they were just that much easier to deploy and manage. The Rack, unlike the Cube, was delivered in a 1U chassis, and this was one of the first, if not the first, 1U Rack-mounted server. The first two versions sported RISC architecture similar to the Cube. These took off in popularity, and the company experienced massive growth, in July of 1999, they had delivered over 11,000 racks to more than 1,000 customers in 60 different countries. All of this success came to a peak when it was announced that they would be acquired by Sun Microsystems in a $2 billion stock purchase. It was an incredible success story at the time. Unfortunately, Sun decided to shutter the Cobalt name in December of 2003. 
and the last product to carry the Cobalt name was the RAQ 550. But in our opinion, the most important legacy from Cobalt is the precedent that they set. They helped establish Linux as a viable platform for serious web hosting, and showed the world that easily deployable servers were the future. As we were all discovering the bounties of the internet, these Cobalt servers were behind the scenes humming along, helping make all of that possible. So when we saw these two Rack 3 servers come up for sale locally, we knew they would be a perfect addition to the Port Museum, so that we can help preserve this unique part of internet history. We mentioned the first two models of the Rack were risk-based. The third model, which is the example we have here, is based on the AMD K62 processor. Cobalt moved away from RISC due to the performance and efficiency gains of x86 processors, and the fact that most server appliances on the market were now predominantly x86 based. Announced in October of 1999, the Rack 3 continued the trend of the previous versions, and they were deployed on a massive scale across the internet. We don't know what condition these are in, so let's go ahead and try booting up the first one to see what we get. On first power up, the 16x2 LCD screen on the front panel is only showing us a single row of blocks. We should be seeing some text output if the boot up was successful. An interesting note about these is that they have no video output. There is only serial output. So we have to hook this up to another PC in order to see what's going on during the boot up. It looks like we're actually able to mount the file system on the hard drive, but then we get a general protection fault and an instruction pointer error. I think that this indicates that the processor is trying to execute something from an invalid memory location. So that's concerning, but let's head over to the serial port workshop, take the lid off and get a look inside. So here are the component locations, and we have the hard drive, of course, in the foreground. The motherboard itself is pretty bare bones, and there are several empty component locations we presume for different versions of this board. We think this board was designed in-house by Cobalt, or maybe contracted out, as it has a Cobalt silkscreen, and we don't know of any board with this specific design and form factor. Let us know in the comments, though, if you recognize it. There is a sticker on the power supply indicating this one was purchased from rackport.com, so not directly from Cobalt. Who knows where this one was prior to that. Typically, rack mount devices should have airflow from front to rear. We do have a CPU fan here, but the front panel PCB is covering basically the entire front of the rack, which would make for questionable airflow. This is only an AMD K62 300MHz CPU though, so not a high thermal output. An obvious issue here is with the electrolytic capacitors. Most of them are slightly bulging at the top, indicating failure. In this application, the capacitors are supposed to provide stable voltage for the CPU. When they start to fail, voltage fluctuations can occur, which can cause all sorts of havoc in digital circuits like this. So I think our first step in getting this back online will be to replace the capacitors on the motherboard. But before we get too far into the weeds with this one, let's go ahead and check out our second Rack 3 to see what kind of condition that one is in. So we actually get some LCD output, which is great, but it seems like we're getting stuck in a loop here as the display just hangs on this message. So let's see what our serial output is showing.
we get much further in the boot process on this one. And we can see that it's running CentOS version 4.7, which was released in 2008. So this definitely has a more recent operating system on it. But we're getting an error reading a block in our file system. On EXT3 file systems, these errors can be caused by abruptly shutting off the system without a clean shutdown. So it may not be anything more than that. Unfortunately, Control D didn't get us any further, so we'll have to use another computer to reset the root password manually. Let's go ahead and take a look inside the second rack though to see what kind of condition the hardware is in. The capacitors here look like they're in even worse condition. This one here is actually leaking some electrolyte. The hard drive is a higher capacity compared to the other rack, so it's probably been changed at some point. But now that we know the condition these are in, we can formulate how we're going to proceed. We definitely want to restore one of these to its original configuration and condition, and we'll be showing that process on upcoming episodes. For the second one though, we're thinking about retrofitting a newer motherboard so that we can run a modern version of Linux. Leave us a comment below if you have any other ideas. Our journey in this video started in 1998. And now we've come full circle with a plan to get at least one of these racks, which helped to bring about one of the greatest transformations of the internet back to its original glory. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you'd like to keep up with our progress. And as always, thank you for watching the Serial Report, and we'll see you next time.